Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What's Up Doc. I am pleased uh, to represent the Concord Hospital Trust staff. I'm very proud to be a member of the staff, and Concord Hospital Trust is, is delighted to bring you our monthly lecture series, What's Up Doc. And we'd like to thank and recognize the Walker Lecture Series for their generous sponsorship of What's Up Doc. We have a terrific program for you today. Our guest physician is Dr. Michael Ferguson, and his topic is minimally invasive heart pumps for critically ill cardiac patients. Dr. Ferguson joined Concord Hospital in 2015. His specialties are cardiology and interventional cardiology. He is board certified in cardiovascular disease, internal medicine, and interventional cardiology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Ferguson. I always like talking with you. Um, we'll try to keep it you know, fairly informal. I actually gave this talk a couple years ago, but we have some new devices that we're using now that we weren't using a couple years ago. We've also done a lot more patients and um, we have some more data to present. So uh, hopefully I won't be boring any of you. But uh, I find this field you know, very fascinating and we can really do a lot to help our patients with this with device, these devices that we're using. So uh, I'm very excited about um, this technology and this patient population and happy to have a chance to share it with you all. So <clears throat> I uh, am the medical director and the resource provider for the Department of Cardiology here at the hospital. I'm gonna talk about protected PCI. So just a few definitions. Uh, first of all, what's a PCI? A PCI is a percutaneous coronary intervention. So percutaneous means we go through the skin. Um, there's no incision involved. Um, it's just a catheter that's placed into the vessel and it's threaded through the vessels in the body. <clears throat> coronary is the arterial supply of the heart. So the heart has its own arterial supply like any organ. And it needs oxygen, quite a bit of oxygen in order to function. Um, and the arteries that supply the heart with blood are called coronary arteries. And an intervention is just, uh, we perform a procedure on those arteries in order to try to improve the blood flow. So uh, usually this involves angioplasty and a stent. So an angioplasty is a balloon that we use to expand the artery. Your arteries are very elastic. So if we just expand the artery and uh, we take the balloon out, they usually will collapse again. So a stent is a piece of metal mesh that acts like a scaffolding and it keeps the artery open and keeps it from collapsing. <clears throat> so this is how the procedure works. Um, there's a stent that is mounted on a balloon. The balloon's deflated. It goes into the artery. We pass it over a wire, which is a very thin uh, metallic wire about the diameter of a, of a human hair. Um, this yellow is a plaque that builds up inside the arteries. It's cholesterol. So we expand the balloon, and the stent expands along with the balloon. And then we deflate the balloon. We take the balloon out. We take the guide wire out, and the stent is left behind. So you have a blockage that's got cholesterol build up in the wall. And then when you open it up with the stent, you have a nice open artery. This is what it looks like on angiography. So when we put the catheter into your coronaries, these are the coronary arteries. I talked about earlier, they supply the heart with blood. Um, this is a blockage in one of the coronary arteries. <clears throat> and after we put the stent in, the blockage is gone, the artery returns to its normal state. Uh, so when we say protected, uh, we have a pump that helps us perform the procedure. It takes over the pumping action of the heart so the heart doesn't have to work as hard. Um, it allows the heart to rest. And this pump supplies blood to the heart itself as well as the other organs in the body so that the heart doesn't have to do any work um, while we're performing the procedure. Uh, you've probably seen this device on television. Um, it's really a remarkable device. Uh, it allows people who are very sick to get back to you know, very high levels of functioning and performing the activities that they enjoy. Um, so uh, this is how the device is inserted. Again, it goes percutaneously, so it goes through an artery in the leg, and then we thread it up into the heart, and then it sits across the aortic valve in the ventricle of the heart. 
So the heart has four chambers. There's uh, atria, which are these little chambers at the top, and ventricles, which are big chambers that do the majority of the pumping. The right ventricle supplies blood to the lungs, and the left ventricle supplies oxygenated blood to the rest of the body when it returns from the lungs. This is what the pump looks like inside the heart. So again, it goes uh, into the oxygenated ventricle. The blood comes in through this inlet chamber and the, the actual pump is here. It uh, sucks up the blood and then delivers it to the rest of the body, again, taking over the pumping action of the heart. <clears throat> um, so this is a schematic of that in action. Again, the blood gets pulled in through this inlet valve and then it gets ejected out here in the aorta, which is the main artery supplying blood to the body. Uh, okay. Uh, we also have a new device that we didn't have a couple years ago uh, called the Impella RP, which is a right heart Impella. So this device is designed to go into the right-sided chambers, which supply blood to the lungs that I mentioned earlier. It's got a different design, but it's the same basic mechanism where blood gets um, taken up here and then ejected out into the pulmonary arteries. So this is what this device looks like in the heart. Again, this is the venous system as opposed to the arterial system. So this is blood flowing into the heart and the lungs. So it uh, sucks blood up here um, in the right atrium and then it delivers it out into the pulmonary arteries. <clears throat> so when your heart is weak and these chambers can't pump, uh, this takes over the action of uh, the chambers that are weak. So we can actually put uh, this device in the venous and the arterial side. So we can put the, the right-sided device uh, into the venous side, into the lungs. We can put the left-sided device into the arterial system. And we can essentially bypass your heart circulation, you know, all done through vessels in your leg. <clears throat> so now the blood, all the work of the heart is being done by these pumps and your heart doesn't have to do any work uh, in order to uh, deliver blood. This is what the devices look like under x-ray. Um, again, this is the right-sided device going up into the lungs, and this is the left-sided device um, delivering blood to the aorta. So, so when we talk about uh, protected PCI, <coughs> there's selected patients that we're interested in performing this procedure on. Uh, it may be patients who are very sick. They have a lot of other medical conditions. Um, they have peripheral vascular disease or diabetes, or they just uh, have a lot of other medical problems that uh, puts them at high risk. Uh, they might have very complex coronary anatomy, so they have multiple arteries that are blocked. Their main artery might be blocked, um, and that's a very high-risk situation. Or they may have a very weak heart. So. Uh, their heart may not be able to squeeze very well. They may be in cardiogenic shock. They may not be able to support their blood pressure or their circulation um, with the heart function itself, and the pump helps to assist with that. <clears throat> um, so these are the hemodynamic effects of the pump. Um, again, you're uh, pulling blood in from the ventricle and you're ejecting it out to the body. So this will increase uh, blood flow to the body it will improve the body's blood pressure. <clears throat> and also, equally as important, it will actually unload the ventricle. So it'll decrease the pressure inside the ventricle itself uh, so that the ventricle doesn't have to work as hard, it doesn't require as much oxygen, and uh, it improves the blood flow to the heart itself. So these are all very desirable effects that this pump provides for us when we're trying to do these high-risk procedures. Um, this is a real-life example of a patient who was not doing well. Their mean arterial pressure, MAP stands for mean arterial pressure, was 50. Normally this should be 70. Their blood pressure was 61 over 40. <clears throat> and their left ventricular pressure, the pressure inside the ventricle, was 28. So they had high pressures in their ventricle and very low blood pressure supplying blood to their body. Um, as soon as the pump was turned on, uh, their blood pressure normalizes within 60 seconds. It goes up to a blood pressure, a mean arterial pressure of 70, which is, you know, above normal. And then the pressure inside the ventricle falls. So again, the ventricle doesn't have to work as hard and doesn't require as much oxygen. 
These are, uh, this is data from the uh, registry for Impella devices. Uh, the, every device that gets put in uh, gets entered into a registry and they track the outcomes of these procedures. Uh, and on average, uh, when the device is put in, the patient's blood pressure will increase by 50%. Their cardiac output, which is the amount of blood that your heart pumps, uh, increases by 56%. Um, cardiac power, which is just a combination of blood pressure and cardiac output, improves by 120%. And again, the uh, left ventricular pressure will fall by on average 40%. And all basically you go from being a very sick patient who can't pump any blood and has a lot of pressure in their heart to having normal blood pressure, normal cardiac output, and normal pressure in the heart. Uh, and this translates into improved outcomes, which is really what we're interested in. We want to make people better uh, with fewer complications. So MACE is just a fancy word for major adverse cardiac events. It includes uh, death, stroke, myocardial infarction, or repeat procedures. And again, if you look at uh, nationwide, using this device will allow us to reduce complication rates by 29% um, in all comers. Um, there's improved uh, quality of life for our patients. Um, on average, our patients' um, heart function will improve by 22% um, after the procedure is completed. Um, and this uh, New York Heart Association class is a classification of symptoms. So if you're class three or class four, you have very severe symptoms. Um, in class one or two are milder symptoms. Uh, and in general, 58% uh, of our patients will improve um, from a very severe uh, symptom class before the procedure to very mild symptoms after the procedure. So, I, if I haven't confused you with all this data, I'd actually like to talk about uh, some real-world patients that we've treated here. The first patient uh, is uh, a 77-year-old woman who um, had a three-vessel bypass procedure performed in 2014. Um, she was admitted uh, three years ago to our hospital with a heart attack and uh, congestive heart failure. Um, her heart function had decreased from normal, which is 65%, down to 40% of, of her heart function. <clears throat> and she was actually very sick. She was on our cardiac ward, bedbound, having severe angina at rest, and you know couldn't even get out of bed. Um, her cardiac cath showed a high-grade blockage in her main coronary artery, and this one artery supplies about 70% of the heart's blood flow, <clears throat> and two of her three bypass grafts were occluded. She was a very poor candidate for a repeat surgical procedure because of her advanced age, she had a prior bypass, and she had a weak heart. So um, we decided to uh, revascularize her with the protected PCI and use of the impella pump. Uh, this is her coronary angiogram. She had a very high grade blockage uh, right here in her main artery. It was 90% blocked. This is the impella device in the body. This is another picture of that showing, you know, this severe blockage in her main coronary artery. <clears throat> and using the device, we were able to, we actually, uh, performed an atherectomy, which is a high-speed drill. This uh, lesion was very heav heavily calcified and couldn't be dilated. So we actually drilled out the artery and then put a stent in and opened up the blockage and reestablished blood flow to her heart. We never would have, been, would have been able to perform this procedure without the assistance of the impella device. Um, and the patient did remarkably well. So again, we did a rotational atherectomy, which is a high-speed drill. Um, the patient tolerated the procedure very well. She had no procedure-related complications. She was actually discharged home the next day. And now, three years later, this patient is doing very well. She uh, is fully ambulatory. She has a great quality of life. Um, she exercises four or five times a week. She's out hiking and playing golf. And her heart function is actually returned to normal. So we consider this to be a great success story. And we're very happy that we were able to uh, treat her and make her better. 
Another case I'd like to review is a 60-year-old woman who had a TAVR, a uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. I think you may have heard about that uh, a couple months ago. <clears throat> so she had a valve put in through her leg in 2018, and then she was admitted uh, a couple years later with heart failure. Um, her heart function had gone from normal down to uh, severely depressed. She was only pumping about 10 or 15% of her blood is a severely impaired heart function. <clears throat> um, her cardiac cath demonstrated an 80% blockage in her main artery, uh, which had caused her heart to be weak. And again, she was also a very poor surgical candidate because not only had she had her aortic valve replaced, she'd also had her mitral valve replaced, and she has very poor heart function. So she would have been extremely high risk, in fact, prohibitive risk from having surgery to uh, fix the blockage. <clears throat> so we performed you know, a protected PCI on her with assistance with the impella. This is a very busy slide, but uh, she has a pacemaker. Um, this is her TAVR valve. Uh, this is her mitral valve. This is the impella device in her ventricle. And you can see she had a blockage right here. Again, at the origin of her main artery, it was 80% blocked. So her heart became very weak because she couldn't get any blood flow through this blockage. So with the assistance of the impella device, we were able to deliver a stent uh, through the side of the TAVR valve. We reopened the artery, reestablished blood flow, and again, this patient did very well. Um, she did have a blockage, actually, in her femoral artery, uh, which was on the opposite side from where we put the impella in. Um, so we went in, actually, with the assistance of Dr. Mursavi, my colleague, we went in and uh, ballooned open this blockage and reestablished flow. And she did fine with no impairment of flow to her leg. Um, so again, the patient received a stent to her main artery. Um, we opened the blockage in her right femoral artery. Uh, so now two years later, her heart failure is completely resolved. Her heart function is returned to normal. Um, and she's out living a normal life, doing everything she loves to do. Um, and has not had any complications or recurrent events, you know, since we opened up her artery. <clears throat> um, so we actually uh, formally, we had been doing this program sort of uh, sporadically in 2015, but uh, we, we launched a real formal protected PCI program in 2016 uh, with the support of, you know, Concord Hospital and the cardiovascular department. Um, so we review all our patients uh, beforehand. We talk about their options and make sure they're a good candidate for this procedure. Um, we uh, <clears throat> track all the results to make sure we're getting good results, and we track complication rates. Um, the team includes Dr. Magnus, who's our uh, director of the cath lab, Dr. Musavi, who I mentioned, Dr. Matthew Gibb, who's our chief medical officer, and myself. <clears throat> um, our nurse is uh, Rasheen Lavalli. She's just critical to this program. <clears throat> she uh, tracks all the patients and uh, tracks all the data and makes sure that um, you know, we're having good results. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do this without our cath lab staff or the nurses and staff in the ICU and the PCU who take care of these patients after we're done. And that's you know, an equally critical part to uh, success with this program. Um, so looking back over the last four years, we've done 85 cases. Uh, 78 of these have been left-sided and seven of these have involved the right-sided device or right and left. Um, all of these procedures have been successful. Uh, we've had no impeller-related major adverse events. Now we have had some complications. We've had some bleeding complications, um, some internal bleeding. Uh, five patients have had large hematomas under the skin. One patient developed heart failure after the procedure. We've done two femoral balloon angioplasty procedures like I showed you, and uh, these eight patients ultimately required blood transfusions. <clears throat> but as far as major complications related to insertion of the device itself, um, we haven't had any complications related to that. Um, so in conclusion, protected PCI, allows us to do coronary interventions uh, safely on sicker patients with more complex anatomy 
These, most of these patients are not candidates for bypass for various reasons. Uh, they really have no other options. If we couldn't perform this protected PCI, uh, there's nothing else we could do for these patients. Um, it allows us to do more complete revascularization so we can open more blockages. We can improve blood flow to the heart, which will also improve heart function. Uh, it protects the heart during the procedure so there's less strain on the heart uh, and improved blood flow. The patients are more stable during the procedure so they have better outcomes with uh, fewer procedure related complications. And ultimately, uh, we improve patient outcomes, we improve survival and we improve their quality of life, which is uh, what it's all about. So that's all I really had. <laughs> Happy to entertain any questions. Yes? I just want to finish. You know, with all of these devices and procedures, would you say that congestive heart failure is, could become a thing of the past? Um, well, uh, maybe someday. <laughs> um, <laughs> because the heart failure is a complex, uh, entity. There's you know, a lot. A heart that's not pumping very well, if you can right. improve the, the pumping, then it's like, like cool, right? So these devices are designed uh, to be used short term. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, in, okay. You know, at the time of a procedure. Oh, okay, got it. Now, many of our patients will actually, their heart failure will resolve by doing the procedure and reestablishing blood flow. So those patients may never have heart problems again. Um, and so it's, it's been very successful in that regard. Now, there are a lot of different things that can cause heart failure. It's not just caused by blockages in your arteries. It can be caused by viruses. It can be caused by COVID. It can be caused by insects. Um, so to completely eliminate heart failure, I think would be you know a monumental test. But there are different pumps that um, can, are actually designed to be used on an ambulatory long-term basis. So you can surgically implant the pump and then walk around with a pump uh, that will take over the heart function of your heart. Um, and those have been you know, pretty successful. Uh, they're still under development, um, but that technology continues to improve you know, every year. Uh, heart failure is a big problem. Uh, you know, it affects, it's one of the uh, top leading causes of death and affects tens of millions of people in the country. Um, but it's a, it is a complex disease that involves a lot of different treatment strategies. And, uh, there's a lot of different causes. So. Thank you. I think it was your first um, case study with the woman who had a triple bypass. Right. And it didn't seem like that not many years between the triple bypass and then it was so blocked that she needed this procedure. Sure. Um, I guess, so that's scary, but um, I guess my question is what kind of follow-up is there with these patients once they've had something like this to ensure that it's not blocked and all that kind of stuff? Um, so um, about 10% of bypass grafts will close in the first year. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, but then after that, the number of grafts that close falls off. But in general, the, the the lifespan of a bypass graft is 10 years. Um, so five years is a pretty short period of time to close up your grafts, but it's not unheard of. Um, the lima graft, which is an arterial graft that you take off your chest wall and patch into your heart, that usually stays open forever. And in this patient, her lima graft was open. So I said two of her three grafts were closed. It was the vein grafts that were taken out of her leg that closed. But her lima stayed open, fortunately, or she probably wouldn't have survived. Um, but uh, for, in terms of follow-up, again, we follow these patients very closely. Um, when they first come out of the hospital, uh, we usually see them within a week or two, and then we see them frequently after that. We like to have all our patients go through cardiac rehab, which uh, also helps people get conditioned and strengthens their hearts. <coughs> um, but ultimately, once you're stabilized and back to your baseline, Typically, we only see folks every you know six to twelve months if they're doing well. Um, the key is really to long-term success with coronary disease is uh, exercise, eating right, um, 
you know, not smoking, you know, having your risk factors under control. Um, so people can do very well for many years, uh, you know, decades even, um, if they remain active and you know continue to have all their cardiac risk factors under control. Is this procedure, doctor, done under a uh, general anesthesia? Usually not. Not under a general. Usually not. We usually do it just with sedation. You know, it depends on the patient. It depends on how sick they are. Uh, depends on how long the procedure is going to be. There's some factors involved, but the overwhelming majority of our cases are done you know, just with sedation, uh, sort of like you would get with a colonoscopy. Yeah. So. You talked about the ambulatory pump, and that's taking over and working. What's happening with your own heart function? And you've got something else pumping for you. Not much. Uh, yeah. I mean, your heart doesn't have to do, it rests. And the pump can do, you know, 90% of the work. So it knows to not, but it doesn't? Uh, no, it'll still, it'll still squeeze. <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't really do, provide much of the heart function. Yeah. In fact, we found, which has surprised a lot of people, that sometimes, these, these ambulatory pumps are only put in people who are very, very sick, no other options. The bed bound, um, waiting for a transplant, and for whatever reason, they can't get one. So the pump is sort of a last resort. And some of these patients actually get better. You give the heart a chance to rest, and the heart function improves, and they can take the pump out, and the patient does well. Uh, most patients don't, but some, some patients do. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you have a, if you have a properly functioning pump in place, your heart doesn't have to do much work at all. The pump can do the majority of it. Is that the same thing as an LVAD? Right. So that's an LVAD. So this is an LVAD. LVAD stands for left ventricular assist device. This is just a percutaneous LVAD. It goes in through your leg. There's different things. <coughs> oh, there's extra. Oh. Right. So, so the ambulatory pump stay in. Right. And people can function with it? Yeah, I mean, you know, Dick Cheney had one, I think, for three or four years. And then what happened? He finally got a transplant. And then he got a transplant. Okay, right. so these are really... So some people have them in for years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Is it age dependent? I'm not revealing any private information. No. <laughs> <laughs> publicly, publicly available information. But yeah, some people have these, these ambulatory pumps for years. And, and do we install those here? Or no, we well, we, we do temporary ones, but that's just a temporizing measure to, uh, until we can you know, transit someone to a, a different facility. In order to, to do that, you'd have to do cardiac transplant. Okay. So there's very few centers, uh, you know, Tufts, Brigham, Mass General, and even Dartmouth is you know, doing those. You really have to be in a transplant advanced heart failure center for that. Yeah. Yes, sir. My wife and I have been very fortunate participants in a series of What's Up Doc lectures. And over the course of the years, we've come to the realization, and this is but the latest indication of the facilities that this community has available to them. We take a lot of comfort in knowing that this kind of facility is available with the technological advances that you've made to make Ed and I feel very fortunate to be here. Well, thank you. We feel very fortunate that we're able to take care of uh, folks and you know support the community. Um, we really can take care of you know 97, 98 percent of the problems that uh, we would expect to face uh, in the whole field of medicine. Uh, the number of patients who actually have to be sent to Boston or university hospitals is uh, pretty minimal. Yeah. And, uh, and we can provide a full range of emergency services. So we can always stabilize folks. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very pleased that we're able to offer these services to the community. Okay. Yes. Has your patient market expanded since we've added so many of these procedures? And um, well, we, I think we were always serving uh, 
you know, sort of central New Hampshire, the Lakes region, Franklin, you know, Con the Concord area. I think we've always been serving that same geographical population. We can just take care of more people than we could before because we have more capabilities. So we can do things that we couldn't do before. We used to have to send our tavers to Boston or you know, to Dartmouth, but now we can do them here. Uh, Dr. Masabi is doing micro procedures. It's another valve procedure. Um, we've been doing that over the last year or so. Uh, we just keep expanding our capabilities. So um, it's not that our geographical area has uh, increased. It's just we can take care of more people, sicker people, than we used to be able to. We get more referrals um, from even further north now. And I think it goes back to Ferguson. So a lot of the, you know, the cases we can now do that we might have started with the referral and had to refer out and stay at the hospital. So I think as, as more and more of the, I think awareness of what we offer has grown. You know, people realize what we can do here. That's been probably the, you know, the biggest change is raising the awareness what's offered right here. Do you, with all of the different things that we offer here, have you ever come upon a, a cardiovascular patient who you can't quite decide which one to use, either because they got so many problems, or, or just it's like, okay, which is going to be the best? Um, I'm just curious. Or is it always cut and dry, this is the procedure, or this is the tool, or this is whatever? No, it's not cut and dried, but <clears throat> fortunately, these devices are pretty extensively studied before we start using them in real patients. So we have a pretty good idea of who's going to benefit the most from a particular device. Um, so most of the time, we know what device we need and who we need to use it in. Uh, so. I like one device per person. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Well, actually, people usually end up with multiple devices. Okay, they, that's what I want to know. They might get this, they might get a valve, they might get a pacemaker. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I ask something also? You know, uh, we have a heart team meeting uh, once a week. Uh, that includes uh, three interventional cardiologists, two cardiac surgeons, and uh, one cardiac imaging specialist. Uh, anything that uh, is not a clear cut uh, is being presented in that meeting and uh, five, six specialists chat about it and make a decision ahead of time. So it's not like, yeah, probably 90% of the work you always are certain, but 10% that is not uh, black and white uh, is a good opportunity that we chat about it once a week. I appreciate you talking about the risk factors because you know the, the second case, the 60-year-old woman. As I get older, that's not that's young. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know honestly, that's we all want to figure out how we can not have them get one. We're very glad that it's available, but yeah. um, I think talking about that all the time is, is, is what we need to do as a hospital. As well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, cardi cardiac. Uh, Coronary atherosclerosis is very much a lifestyle disease. And um, if people started younger and took good care of themselves, a lot of these folks wouldn't have problems later in life. It includes smoking, eating right, exercise, having your blood pressure under control. Um, yeah, those are, those are more important than anything else we do. I mean, these are temporizing and stabilizing measures. Sure. But you're not going to do well long term if you don't have all your risk factors under control. Is that part of what we do after the fact? Is, is we have uh, many people who are involved, cardiac rehab, nurses, nurse practitioners, um, the whole clinic uh, taking care of folks. So, yeah, all of those things are critical. The primary care doctors, sure. So, when you think about lifestyle versus heredity, mm -hmm. where is the balance? Is lifestyle more important? Or will lifestyle overtake? Uh, uh, um, heredity in terms of uh, uh, cardiac disease? Most of the time it will. There are some patients who just aren't going to do well because of their genetic predisposition regardless. But um, most of the time you can compensate for having you know, adverse genetics by 
uh, you know, having all your other risk factors under control. So, uh, especially in this country, it's mostly lifestyle and less genetic. Uh, but, uh, you know, even if you have, you know, a genetic predisposition, you can oftentimes overcome that just by living a very healthy lifestyle. On behalf of the Trust, thank you very much, Dr. Ferguson, for a very insightful presentation. And uh, thank you to uh, all of our attendees here and to our virtual audience. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you will join us in January when Dr. Matthew Gibb will provide an overview, a comprehensive overview of the Cardiovascular Institute. And we'll talk about the multitude of services available here at Concord Hospital. On behalf of the entire trust staff, we wish you a safe and healthy, happy, and joy-filled holiday season, and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you.